Hey, sorry for interrupting. This is Perry Kurtz, and I just want to tell you, I've got a new podcast. I know you're saying, oh, great, another one. Well, this one's different. It's called Happy News with Perry Kurtz. Happy news, good stuff, things to make you feel good about life. We're going to be talking to famous and infamous people that are friends of mine and discussing the happy news. You can listen to us on iTunes, Stitcher, CastBox, and wherever you listen to your podcast, as well as watching us on Binge On This on YouTube. When I was little, my father was famous. He was the greatest samurai in the empire. My father would go home to mother, and we were happy. Then, one night, they were supposed to kill my father, but they didn't. They left his samurai life. That's the first tool you use. Now take your seat, boy. Starting right now, I'm going to teach you how to read. Alan Bean Plus Four by Tom Hanks Traveling to the moon was way less complicated this year than it was back in 1969, as the four of us proved. Not that anyone gives a hoot. You see, over cold beers on my patio with the crescent moon, a delicate princess fingernail low in the west... I told Steve Wong that if he threw, say, a hammer with enough muscle, said tool could make a 500,000-mile figure eight, sail around that very moon, and return to Earth like a boomerang. And wasn't that fascinating? Stephen Wong works at Home Depot, so has access to many hammers. He offered to chuck a few. His co-worker, M. Dash, who'd shortened his long tribal name to Rap Star Length, Wondered how one would catch a red-hot hammer falling at a thousand miles an hour. Anna, who does something in web design, said that there'd be nothing to catch, as the hammer would burn up like a meteor, and she was right. Plus, she didn't buy the simplicity of my cosmic throw, weight return. She's ever doubtful of my space program bona fides. She says I'm always Apollo 13 this and Luna code that, and have begun to falsify details in order to sound like an expert. And she's right about that, too. I keep all of my nonfiction on a pocket-sized Kobo digital reader, so I whipped out a chapter from No Way Ivan, Why the CCCP Lost the Race to the Moon, written by an Imagier professor with an axe to grind. According to him, in the mid-60s, the Soviets hoped to trump the Apollo program with just such a figure, eight mission. No orbit, no landing, just photos and crowing rights. The Reds sent off an unmanned Soyuz with supposedly a mannequin in a spacesuit. But so many things went south that they didn't dare try again. Not even with the dog. Kaputnik. Anna is as thin and smart as a whip and driven like no one else I have ever dated for three exhausting weeks. She saw a challenge here. She wanted to succeed where the Russians had failed. It would be fun. We'd all go, she said. And that was that. But when? I suggested that we schedule liftoff in conjunction with the 45th anniversary of Apollo 11, the most famous space flight in history. But that was a no-go, as Steve Wong had dental work scheduled for the third week of July. How about November, when Apollo 12 landed in the ocean of storms? Also 45 years ago, but forgotten by 99.999% of the people on Earth? Anna had to be a bridesmaid at her sister's wedding the week after Halloween. So the best date for the mission turned out to be September 27th, a Saturday. Astronauts in the Apollo era had spent thousands of hours piloting jet planes and earning engineering degrees. They'd practiced escaping from launch pad disasters by sliding down long cables to the safety of thickly padded bunkers. They had to know how slide rulers worked. We did none of that, though we did test fly our booster on the 4th of July out of Steve Wong's huge driveway in Oxnard, hoping that, with all the fireworks, our unmanned first stage would blow through the night sky and notice. Mission accomplished. That rocket cleared Baja and is right now zipping around the Earth every 90 minutes. And let me state clearly, for the sake of multiple government agencies, we'll probably burn up harmlessly on re-entry in 12 to 14 months. 
Madash, who was born in a sub-Saharan village, has a super brain. In junior high, with minimal English skills, he won a science fair award of merit with an experiment on ablative materials, which caught on fire, to the delight of everyone. Since having a working heat shield is implied in the phrase returning safely to Earth, Madash was in charge of that and all things pyrotechnic, including the explosive bolts for stage separation. Anna did the math, all the load lift ratios, orbital mechanics, fuel mixtures, and formulas. The stuff I pretend to know, but which actually leaves me in a fog. My contribution was the command module, a cramped headlight-shaped cephroid that was cobbled together by a very rich pool supply magnet, who was hell-bent on getting into the private aerospace business to make him some big-time NASA cash. He died in his sleep just before his 94th birthday, and his fourth wife-slash-widow agreed to sell me the capsule for a hundred bucks, provided I got it out of the garage by the weekend. I named the capsule the Allen Bean, in honor of the lunar module pilot of the Apollo 12 the fourth man to walk on the moon and the only one I ever met in a Houston area Mexican restaurant in 1986. He was paying the cashier as anonymous as a balding orthopedist when I yelled out, holy cow, you're Al Bean. He gave me his autograph and drew a tiny astronaut above his name. Since four of us would be a coming around the moon, I needed to make room inside the Allen Bean and eliminate pounds. We'd have no mission control to boss us around, so I ripped out all the comms. I replaced every bolt, screw, hinge, clip, and connector with duct tape. Three bucks roll at Home Depot. Our privy was a shower curtain for privacy. I've heard from an experienced source that a trip to the John in zero gravity requires that you strip naked and give yourself half an hour. So yeah, privacy was key. I replaced the outer opening hatch and its bulky lock evac apparatus with a steel alloy plug that had a big window and a self-sealing bib. In the vacuum of space, the air pressure inside the Allen Bean would force the hatch closed and airtight. It's simple physics. Announce that you're flying to the moon and everyone assumes that you mean to land on it. To plant a flag, kangaroo hop in one-sixth gravity and collect rocks to bring home, none of which we were going to do. We were flying around the moon. Landing is a whole different ball game. And as for stepping out onto the surface, hell, choosing which one of the four of us would get out first and become the 13th person to leave boot prints up there would have led to so much bad blood that our crew would have broken up long before T-minus 10 seconds and counting. Assembling the three stages of the good ship Allen Bean took two days. We packed granola bars and water in squeeze top bottles, then pumped in the liquid oxygen for the two booster stages, and the hypergolic chemicals for the one-shot firing of the translunar motor, the mini rocket that would fling us to our lunar rendezvous. Most of Oxnard came around to Steve Wong's driveway to ogle the Allen Bean, not a one of them knowing who Alan Bean was or why we'd named the rocket ship after him. The kids begged for peeks inside the spacecraft, but we didn't have the insurance. What are you waiting for? You gonna blast off soon? To every knothead who would listen, I explained launch windows and trajectories, showing them on my moon phase app how we had to intersect the moon's orbit at exactly the right moment or lunar gravity would... Ah, hell, there's the moon. Point your rocket at it and put on a show. 24 seconds after clearing the tower, our first stage was burning all stops, and the Max Q app showed us pulling 11.8 times our weight at sea level. Not that we needed iPhones to tell us this. We were fighting for breath with Anna, screaming, Get off my chest! But no one was on her chest. She was, in fact, sitting on me, crushing me like a lap dance from an offensive line man. Kaboom! went Madash's dynamite bolts, and the second stage fired, as programmed. A minute later, dust, loose change, and a couple of ballpoint pens floated up from behind our seats, signaling, Hey, we'd achieved orbit. Weightlessness is as much fun as you can imagine, but troublesome for some spacegoers, who for no apparent reason spend their first hours up there upchucking, 
as if they'd overdone it at the pre-launch reception. It's one of those facts never made public by NASA's PR, or in astronaut memoirs. After three revolutions of the Earth, as we finished running the checklist for our translunar injection, Steve Wong's tummy finally settled down. Somewhere over Africa, we opened the valves in the translunar motor, the hypergolic worked their chemical magic, and whoosh, we were hauling the mail to Moonberry RFD, our escape velocity a crisp seven miles per second. Earth getting smaller and smaller in our window. The Americans who went to the moon before us had computers so primitive that they couldn't get email or use Google to settle arguments. The iPads we took had something like 70 billion times the capacity of those Apollo-era dial-ups and were mucho handy, especially during all the downtime on our long haul. Madash used to watch season four of Breaking Bad. We took hundreds of selfies with the Earth in the windows, and plinking a ping pong ball off the center seat, played a tableless table tennis tournament, which was won by Anna. I worked the attitude jets in pulse mode, yawing and pitching the Allen Bean for views of some of the few stars that were visible in the naked sunlight. Antares, Nunki, the global cluster NGC 6333, none of which twinkle when you're up there amongst them. The big event of translunar space is crossing the equigravisphere, a boundary as invisible as the international date line, but for the Alan Bean, the Rubicon. On this side of the EQS, Earth's gravity was tugging us back, slowing our progress, biting us to return home to the life-affirming benefits of water, atmosphere, and a magnetic field. Once we crossed, the moon grabbed hold, wrapping us in her ancient silvery embrace, whispering to us to hurry, 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 to wink in wonder at her magnificent desolation. At the exact moment that we reached the threshold, Anna awarded us origami cranes made out of aluminum foil, which we taped onto our shirts like pilot wings. I put the Allen Bean into a passive thermal control barbecue roll, our moon-bound ship rotating on an invisible spit so as to distribute the solar heat. Then we dimmed the lights, taped a sweatshirt over the window to keep the sunlight from sweeping across the cabin, and slept. Each of us curled up in a comfortable nook of our little rocket ship. When I tell people that I've seen the far side of the moon, they often say, you mean the dark side, as though I'd fallen under the spell of Darth Vader or Pink Floyd. In fact, both sides of the moon get the same amount of sunshine, just on different ships. Because the moon was waxing gibbous to the folks back home, we had to wait out the shadowed portion on the other side. In that darkness, with no sunlight, and the moon blocking the Earth's reflection, I pulsed the Allen Bean around so that our window faced outbound for a view of the infinite time-space continuum that was worthy of IMAX. Unblinking stars in subtle hues of red and orange, yellow and green, blue, indigo, violet. Our galaxy stretching as far as our eyes were wide. A diamond blue carpet against the black that would have been terrifying had it not been so mesmerizing. Then there was light, snapping on as if Madash had flipped a switch. I tweaked the controls and there below us was the surface of the moon. Wow. Gorgeous in a way that strained any use of the word. A rugged place that produced oohs and ahs. The Luna Ticket app showed us traversing south to north, but we were mentally lost in space, the surface as chaotic as a wind-blown gray-capped bay, until I matched the Point Care Impact Basin with the This Is Our Moon Guide on my Kobo. The Allen Bean was soaring 153 kilometers high, 95.06 miles Americanus, at a speed faster than that of a bullet from a gun. And the moon was slipping by so fast that we were running out of far side. Orsom's crater had white finger-painted streaks. Heaviside showed rills and depressions like river washouts. We split Dufay right in half, a flyover from six to its twelve, the rim a steep, sharp razor. Mare Moskiviens was far to port, a mini version of the ocean of storms, 
where four and a half decades ago, the real Alan Bean stepped two days hiking, collecting rocks, taking photos. Lucky man. Our brains could take in only so much, so our iPhones did the recording. And I stopped calling out the sights, though I did recognize Campbell and De Alambrent's large craters linked by the smaller silver, just as we were about to head home over the moon's north pole. Steve Wong had queued up a certain musical track for what would be Earthrise, but had to reboot the Bluetooth on Anna's jam box and was nearly late for his cue. Madash yelled, Hit play, hit play, just as a blue and white patch of life, a slice of all that we have made of ourselves, all that we had ever been, pierced the black cosmos above the sawtooth horizon. I was expecting something classical, Franz Joseph Hayden or George Harrison, but the circle of life from Lion King scored our home planet's rise over the plaster of Paris moon. Really? A Disney show tune? But you know, that rhythm and that chorus and the double meaning of the lyrics caught me right in the throat and I choked up. Tears popped off my face and joined the other tears, which were floating around the Allen Bean. Anna gave me a hug like I was still her boyfriend. We cried. We all cried. You'd have done the same. Coasting home was one fat anti-climax. Despite the never-spoken possibility of our burning up on re-entry like an obsolete spy satellite circa 1962. Of course we were all chuffed, as the English say, that we'd made the trek and maxed out the memory on our iPhones with iPhotos. But questions arose about what we were going to do upon our return, apart from making some bitchin' posts on Instagram. If I ever run into Al Bean again, I'll ask him what life has been like for him since he twice crossed the equigravosphere. Does he suffer melancholia on quiet afternoons as the world spins on automatic? Will I occasionally get the blues because nothing holds a wonder equal to splitting Dufay down the middle? TBD, I suppose. Whoa, Kamchatka, Anna called out as our heat shield expired into millions of grain-sized comets. We were arcing down over the Arctic Circle, gravity once again commanding that we who went up must come down. When the shoot pyro shot off, the Allen Bean jotted our bones, causing the jam box to lose its duct tape purchase and conk Madash in the forehead. By the time we splashed down off of Oahu, a trail of blood was running from the ugly gash between his eyebrows. Anna tossed him her bandana, because guess what no one had thought to take around the moon? To anyone reading this with plans to imitate us. Band-Aids. At stable one, that is, bobbing in the ocean rather than having disintegrated into plasma, Madash tripped the rescue us flares that he'd rigged underneath the parachute jettison system. I opened the pressure equalizing valve a tad early and, oops, noxious fumes from the excess fuel burn-off were sucked into the capsule, making us even queasier, what with the mal de mer. Once the cabin pressure was as the same PSI as outside, Steve Wong was able to uncork the main hatch and the Pacific Ocean breeze whooshed in as soft as a kiss from Mother Earth. But owing to what turned out to be a huge design flaw, that same Pacific Ocean began to join us in our spent little craft. The Allen Bean's second historic voyage was going to be to the Davy Jones locker. Anna, thinking fast, held aloft our Apple products, but Steve Wong lost his Samsung, the Galaxy, ha, <laughs> which disappeared into the lower equipment bay as the rising seawater bade us exit. The day boat from Kalia Hilton, filled with curious snorkelers, pulled us out of the water, the English speakers on board telling us that we smelled horrid, the foreigners giving us a wide berth. After a shower and a change of clothes, I was ladling fruit salad from a decorative dugout canoe at the hotel buffet table when a lady asked me if I'd been in that thing that came down out of the sky. Yes, I told her. I'd gone all the way to the moon and returned safely to the surly bonds of Earth just like Alan Bean. Who? She said. All right, young warriors. And that was Alan Bean plus four by Tom Hanks. That's right. The real Tom Hanks. This was the first time that I read this story and I enjoyed it. It was very interesting. I've never read anything written by Tom Hanks. 
So it was nice to see what a world-class actor can do when it comes to, to literature. Uh, it was very interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. It is available for anybody to read on the New Yorker website. Just go online and Google or binge Alan Bean Plus Four. It'll pull it right up for you. That way you can give it a quick little read if you felt my narration wasn't good enough. As always, please make sure to comment, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, Binge On This, as well as to our Instagram page, Binge On This Channel. And if you guys have any short stories that you'd like me to read, feel free to email us at bingeonthischannel at gmail.com or leave a comment. And as always, remember, young warriors, that we live by the book, but we die by the blade.